when I was a principal, when I was in central office, especially to stay connected to the classroom, here is something that I would often do. And I, I absolutely loved it. I would actually call up a school, a principal and say, Hey, I would love to just kind of be in the classroom with one of your teachers to just kind of experience what's happening there. And I, I want to just, I got to do some email, got to do some stuff. So I, I, I want to be there for three hours. Is there anybody in your school that would be welcome to having me in their classroom? And they said, no problem. So I would actually show up at that school and I would just kind of say hi to the teacher and I would go in and just kind of be in the space. They'd have like a table set up for me. And the one thing I would always say to, to the teacher in the classroom is, look, I'm not here to observe you. I'm here actually to observe the environment that we put you in so I can actually have an understanding of how we can best support you. And I remember actually one time uh, a teacher was uh, in this room trying to get Wi-Fi. And we didn't do a very good job at the district level ensuring that Wi-Fi was ready to go, that it was just quick and easy for staff and students to get on. I remember that, that teacher standing on a table and holding up an iPad trying to like catch a signal and i just will never forget that and i don't even know if that works does it work maybe i don't know and i remember actually sitting in that room during that time calling the it department saying look this this wi-fi does not work in this classroom and we need to get this going because this teacher is doing everything they can to make stuff work we got to make it easy because some teachers will jump through these hoops others will say i'm not even bothering the next time and then we won't even have access to it. They won't even utilize it. We won't see the value and the importance of it. We have to make it easy for everyone. And I remember the teachers looking at me and saying, thank you, right? And, and thanking me for that. And the reason I share this story with you is because we have this idea that, you know, central office works somewhere, you know, uh, when we're like consultants and stuff like that, we're disconnected from the classroom. And that can be true if you choose to disconnect yourself. Whereas when we find opportunities to really connect in the spaces where, let's be honest, we make a lot of decisions at the central office level, at the admin level. We need to be in those spaces to see what are the effects of the decisions that we make on others, right? And kind of seeing that, and it will tell you a lot um, about what some of your, your decisions are and how you can best support. Like I said, it's not about observing the teacher, it's about the, observing the environment. It's a very different distinction. And I, and I bring this all up because I had this really wonderful talk um, with Lisa Smiley and Shauna Montgomery on this podcast. Now I've known these two for a long time. They do some really incredible work and they're always focused on really connecting with the people that they serve and finding ways to really kind of bring out the best and really kind of connect with students. So we talked about this, uh, you know, in the podcast, we talked about a lot of other things too. Uh, they're just two wonderful people and they're really close and connected and they got some really great ideas. And I, I'm really glad that you're here to, to listen to our conversation. I just had a blast. So thanks for being here today. And welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, it's George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so glad to have Shauna Montgomery and Lisa Smiley, uh, both incredible educators in the Pennsylvania area. They are close by Harrisburg, so kind of like central Pennsylvania, is that correct? Right, mm -hmm. South Central. So, yeah, and so well, very South Central. I don't want you. I don't South want anyone Central. mixed up with the North Central staff. Well, That's right. right. That's <laughs> we different. That's like a totally different. That's, other parts. There's of the mountains state. in between. We gotta. We gotta. Okay, keep guys. <laughs> right. Okay, it's good to know. All right, I'm learning a little about Pennsylvania right now. So <laughs> I actually, I know, uh, I know a ton of educators from Pennsylvania because I was actually uh, at Pete and C. Give a little shout out, Pete and C. Uh, years ago, one of my favorite events I've ever had the opportunity to speak at, and I've actually still connect with them. Uh, they'll send me messages every now and then, the conference organizers. So um, they always made me feel not only welcome before I came, but after, which is always appreciated. But I know Lisa and Shauna from uh, working to them. They were in one of my cohorts and uh, really blessed to, to know both of you because you always push my thinking. You're very supportive. Um, of my work, and I hope I've been the same for you in return. But uh, Lisa and Shauna, if you, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Shauna. Shauna, if you can just and do the same, Lisa, after her, just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do today, and how you got there. Uh, yeah, so uh, Shauna Montgomery and I am. I work for the Capital Area Intermediate Unit, which is um, an educational service agency in Pennsylvania. Our whole staff is and um, 
So my role right now is I'm working with um, a state agency as a contractor to get up a program, a new program up and running for 16 to 18 year old students who are speaking out. It's a residential program in conjunction with National Bureau that runs similar programs across, across the country. Uh, it's called Keystone State Challenge Academy. And so um, I'm kind of the lead educator slash soon to be principal uh, when we have our first class coming in. And um, we just, right now my role is just to get the, the academic portion of that. So well, tell me, tell me what, tell me what the transition when you become a principal, like, what is that? How does that look right now? Like, are you designing stuff right now? Like, how's that working? Yeah. So right now we're a brand new program. It's the first of its kind in Pennsylvania. So we are trying to, you know, develop things like, you know, our, our curriculum and, and hiring staff and, and just building it basically from the ground up and, and trying to figure out what it's going to look like um, on the education side. Cause we're, we offer credit recovery and we also GED options for students. Right. Um, so just building everything um, and getting it all started. So right now I'm, I'm doing that. And then eventually once first class comes in in July then I'll transition over to more of a and what and that's such an incredible opportunity. I actually remember I was speaking at I think it was a curriculum conference in Pennsylvania, and I remember distinctly um, just really kind of how forward thinking the state is education wise. And I love that you're. I, I know this about you, right? They'll kind of give you some guidelines, but you're going to create something pretty special. So I appreciate that you have that that flow. And so Lisa, let's hear a little bit about who you are and what you do today. Uh, my name is Lisa Smiley. I am also an employee at the Capital Area Intermediate Unit. I think this is my 19th year at the IU, um, but my 21st year in education. Um, at my time at the IU, I've been an autism support teacher. I've been an educational consultant where I traveled to different schools and supported kids who were either in um, inclusive settings or or pull out classrooms and help their teachers um, just understand autism and the best uh, ways to support them. Um, and then about four years ago, I took a job to be Shauna Montgomery's partner <laughs> right. in inclusive practices. So now we're more in charge of um, designing and delivering de um, professional development for teachers in our region. So, right. And so what, what, like in the last, I know, like basically everyone's kind of sick of COVID, right? Right. Like <laughs> it's over. I can't go to this. It. Yeah. It depends on where you live. Right. So the, so the, uh, so when you're looking at the last year, a couple of years of professional development, what are some of the kind of unique things that you both did to like kind of offer professional learning? And like this, this is true. And, or maybe I'm off, right? Like it's hard to really push yourselves to grow um, when you are pushed to grow, whether you like it or not. And you're just trying to get through the day. Right. Uh, and, and like you're just exhausted and overwhelmed. And it's like, oh, but you need to like also do this thing and this thing like and maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe it's different there. But like, I think some people are just, you know, be, a success is just getting through through the day. Right. So like how, how did professional learning look over the last couple of years? I think we definitely saw that, that yeah. we're like, hey, we have this session and people are like, yeah, no, um, we're no, right. uh, like we, we're, we're ready to just be done and, and go home and, you know, crawl under the covers. Um, not, not all the time. I think one thing that really changed for us was we had been um, really diving into universal design for learning probably what Lisa two years before the pandemic really hit. Yeah. Um, so we were we were really invested in UDL, right? And that was a game changer for us, I think, during the pandemic because we kind of already had some momentum about ways that we could do things differently that supported people in a variety of different situations and you know. Um, having to go from in-person, a lot of in-person learning to remote as far as even PD was difficult. You know, we right. um, maybe didn't have the same exact experience as teachers who had to do it in classrooms, right. but it was similar in that, you know, we were used to going to districts and doing in-person, you know, professional development sessions and now and we were doing it all too. So um, I would say that one thing that was really super helpful for us just having a little bit of background in, in universal design for right. learning and then really using that to make our PD offerings much more accessible to engage in, even though. And so I, I got to ask this question and maybe Lisa, you want to ask the, or answer this. 
when you look at, so I'm assuming we're, you're basically back to like in person the majority of time for PD now. Like, okay, I guess not all the time, right? Okay. So what are, what are some of the things, and I'll, I'll pose this to you, Lisa, and see, and Shauna, maybe you want to jump in too. If you look at some of the stuff when we just were remote, right? What are some of like the takeaways that you had from that process that you might apply to in person, right? Like, what are some of the things that you say, you know what, like we started doing this and like, why wouldn't we do this when we're all together? Is there anything that you saw there that, you know, would be that you could see as beneficial moving forward? A hundred percent. Absolutely. We started um, using a lot of, well, first of all, I just have to go back and say that during the pandemic, we were so incredibly lucky (laughs) in our positions because suddenly we found ourselves with the gift of time. And we had a lot of time to sit down and think about like, not a lot of people are saying, Hey, we want you to come to our school and do trainings because they were just trying to survive. So we had the opportunity to sit down and say, what could this look like in a virtual space and really be thoughtful and intentional? Um, Whereas teachers were not afforded that luxury. They were like, get it tomorrow. (laughs) And so we did a lot of stuff to, um, to really reach more teachers in an accessible way. Uh, But one thing that we started doing during our trainings that we're trying to continue now, but it's almost harder in person, is offering um, breakout opportunities for people to explore on their own or find different resources. Um, And it's a little bit harder when people are used to um, standing up and hearing a speaker for three hours or whatever. And now we're saying, okay, if you want to learn about this, you go over here and we're going to try to keep it down over there. So trying to like break things up a little okay. bit um, has been a little bit of a challenge, but people have really responded that they really like it that way. They really appreciate that we factor in learner variability when in ways that we didn't before the pandemic, maybe. I don't know if you want to add anything, Shauna. I think the one thing that came to my mind that, you know, I see us carrying over from online or virtual learning and that I hope we we don't ever lose is just the way that we started out sessions. So, you know, you always have that kind of weird speaker. Okay, everyone's here. Like, let's have a, a little time to chat. And it's, right. it's sometimes it's okay. And sometimes it's like, you know, people kind of roll their eyes. I can't believe we're doing another icebreaker. And so... One thing that we learned and that we started really implementing in all of our sessions was more um, like checking in, like, how are you? Um, you yeah. know, we use mood meters and we use meme check-ins and those things that, that worked really nicely online. And now right. we ha- we do have to figure out a little bit how to, to convert them to more of an in-person thing because they right. do, they're just, they lend themselves so nicely online. But, you know, when you get used to taking that time at the beginning of the session, just people tell us how you're doing. And if you're not okay, that's okay too. And here's some resources, here's some options for you so that you can not be okay, but still kind of be engaged with us. And that was one thing that I think made a huge difference. And I really hope that continues forever um, in our sessions because it just makes the difference. Didn't we learn that from this guy named um, George? I think. No, nah. like, <laughs> nah, okay. like that was it. But, hey, I was actually yeah. going to just say, you know, one of the one of the things that when I was thinking about what you just said about doing that in person, so I had to like I I've always done that in person, and then I had to figure out how to do this virtually, and like how I did it in person. Um, you know, I have the blessing to speak at lots of different conferences. I go out and just talk to people and welcome them and stuff like that, and sometimes I don't have con- like the you you've you've all seen this right they have their awards and they have this and it's like oh my god you know like not a fan i'm not gonna lie because a lot of people you know and it's i hey i love when seeing people being recognized um but i think uh, a lot of times people you know kind of just get lost in like who we're kind of like paying who we should be paying attention to and that's the people we're serving that day and i would just go out and talk to people and check in on them, see how they're doing. Whereas, you know, I've been offered like, Hey, do you want to go to this green room? I'm like, God, no, I do not want to do that. And I feel like I lose something out of that process too, because it may, it, you know, I get nerves, I get, you know, discomfort with that process and kind of like thinking about some of those stories and then kind of going where I struggled was how do I actually do this where I don't have that opportunity to kind of go out and I actually, I'm not trying to like 
throw any conference on the bus, but like I just did one and it was like, they just had like the running slides and like, boop, 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 boop. and it was like elevator music. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. This is not like a good way to start. And then it's just like, let's go. And then it was just like, music's off intro. Let's go. And I'm like, oh, this is like harder because you're not like building that time to connect. Right. And like, again, when I'm not running it, when I'm asked to like come into it, I, I try to honor that space. But I think we forget that. Like I always say, like if you spend 50 minutes connecting with people and 45 minutes on content, it's way better than 60 minutes on content because nobody's listening, right? They're right. more invested in that day. One thing that I, I have to tell you, we totally stole an idea from you um, because it was something that we both were like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. So in one of our uh, PLN sessions, I think it was PLN, wasn't it? Right. It was um, LLA. It was Learning and Leading yeah. Academy. Yeah, Learning and Leading Academy. Yeah. You had opened up with Name That Tune because oh, you yeah. had just gotten your soundboard. And oh, you didn't yeah. have a soundboard. We didn't have anything to school. Love it. <laughs> but our very next session, we built that in. We like, you know, oh, yeah. configured our Google Slides that had different things and people could pick different, like, you know, a different picture and it would link to a, a song and, oh, yeah. you know, we, we, I particularly loved it when you did it because I was like, oh my gosh, he's playing all my favorite songs from the late <laughs> in the 80s and early 90s. Yeah. Like, this is awesome. Um, and that was something that was a lot of fun. Like, it just kind of got people talking and, and connecting yeah. and, you know, had a little bit of fun. And, you know, I think you can't underestimate the value of opening something that, um, you know, opening a session in that way where it's just, you just are personable and you have fun and you let people know that you know let's not take this to right and right and that, that that for me a lot of times they're like george is speaking blah 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 and then before i even get into it i'm just like hey i'm a big goof and i'm just having fun they're like this is kind of weird like this guy's gonna teach us stuff right but they're like more interested in it and name that name that tune on zoom is like one of my favorite things to do right Messing with it's people, <laughs> playing, you know, music and seeing who gets it. And like, you know, people start throwing up bad guesses, which are awesome. And, you know, well, yeah, it's, it's like my favorite. It's like, I probably, I go to it too much now, but I still, it's just, I, I, I my, my second profession that I wish I could have been was DJ. That's like my favorite thing ever. So the, the other <laughs> thing that we do that you had taught us was, um, having people give a shout out to their colleagues. We yeah. were doing that during, it's much easier online to do that because people feel more comfortable typing in the chat. Yeah. But that has been a really great way to start off on a positive note. And uh, people really enjoyed that. So the weird thing about that is when I do, so I do that, like the gratitude question, like who's someone that you want to like, you know, that you appreciate that's done X, Y, and Z and like, tell us what they did. And they're getting recognized in that space. The really weird thing about that no one's saying my name because they don't know me from that day, but I'm like feeling way better. Do you know what I mean? Like I feel yeah. like I got the shout out. Like it's just like there's an energy that goes in the room because people are starting off by what they appreciate about each other. And I, I don't I don't think we do that enough in education, right? I think we always right. focus on like where we're weak, where we need to grow. Uh, and so I, I guess kind of transitioning and you know to this idea, um, I know that you work with a lot of administrators kind of leading through this process and kind of trying to support them. So like, what are some of the, cause we can talk about like what went wrong, but I don't think that necessarily helps people move forward. What are some of the best things that you saw like administrators do during this time to like support their staff, to support the kids? What are some of the things that you saw through this process? We have been working with the district um, all year long and it has been a bumpy road because this has mm -hmm. been a very difficult year. Um, and the, and they're trying to make big changes and trying to do a lot of things at once. Um, and anyway, I think the best thing that the supervisor or the principals have done is put a pause in a bunch of stuff and say, yeah. can we just hold on a second? Can we slow down, bump it back to every other week, slow, smaller bits. Um, and that's been very helpful for the staff and I think helpful for us too. Mm -hmm. So. I think that would be my example. I, and I love that. Shauna, what do you got? I was thinking of another another school that we were working with that um, had done a grant last year. And so, you know, spent a whole year really invested in having their um, some key stakeholders within the district learning about mm. universities. 
for learning. And then what they did this year was they said, okay, now we want to scale this, but we want to be really intentional and I think uh, reasonable about it. So they set up like monthly times with us that they could have some of their curriculum designers come in and share what they're doing and share some, some sample lessons and just receive feedback. And we would say, hey, you know, here's some things to think about with universal design. But it was, it was um, very manageable as far as the time. Like it wasn't, hey, we're going to come in and, and give you all this information for a full day. It was really more um, conversational. And it, that happened after they had people really doing a lot of different things. So last year they did some people did a book study. Some people came to sessions that were provided by our state. And, you know, some people worked with us and we did some sessions. So um, it was very individualized based on what they, mm -hmm. they could manage last year. And then this year they kind of scaled a little bit and they didn't bite off more than they could chew. And so um, I haven't heard yet, yet if they're planning right. on scaling further next year, but I thought that was really, um, that was really big to say, we realized that the last last year and especially this year have been incredibly difficult. Let's not do too much. Yeah, and th this is like when when you talk about the the scaling process, right? I think, and we we kind of talked about this in, in you know the the cohorts that we were working in together. Um, a lot of times, the there's a person who's like the curriculum specialist and blah blah blah, right? And they almost create it where there's a dependence upon that person having knowledge and sharing that out, as opposed to that person spreading that knowledge, uh, really empowering people that will never necessarily have that role, but then that's how it spreads. Right. So then you're kind of, and then there's this, there's this notion and it's like the li biggest lie ever. Oh, like, you know, you should be really good that you work yourself out of a job. If you're that good that you've built such capacity, people will continue to find other jobs for you. They'll never right. like, <laughs> Oh, you know what? You are like so successful at this, but too successful and now you're going to lose your job. They'll move you somewhere else. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. like that, that building capacity is one thing. There's one thing that I was a really kind of striking statement to me. And it, I've said it, I think I've said it before, but it is a little, it kind of gets people mad and that's okay. But I want people to think about it. People like say, it's not COVID that did this stuff. It was our response. Right. So like some districts are doing really well. Some districts are like teachers can't, can't handle stuff. They're like overwhelmed. They're just, you know, bombarded with things. And it wasn't like COVID came and said, Hey, I'm COVID. And here's what you do. It was the response, right? It's how we interact with that. Like if you're seeing your people are overwhelmed, you don't give them more stuff, right? You support them through that process. And you know, you, you really, I think part of the work that, you know, you, you two do very well is you really individualize that. You see like, Hey, this one, this person right now is like having a tough time. We just got to be there for whatever support they need. And this person, you know, maybe needs craving some mentorship, maybe is craving some of this stuff. And that's where they're at at this time for, you know, like professional stuff, uh, personal stuff. Right. Uh, like I always think about how George that has a family has kids. And George, who, you know, was like 100% all about his job, totally different, are two different people. And it's, and it's not because I didn't have kids. It's just my mentality. It was just like how I thought at the time, right? And I think we go through different phases. Whereas, you know, there's, there's a time where I was uh, single, had no kids, and also did not really care about my job that much either, right? Because there's other aspects of my life going on. So I think it's just kind of recognizing that the personal does seep into the professional, and honoring some of that stuff too. Uh, here's a question that I'm really curious about your thinking. So you both kind of, I don't, is this like, would you say this is like a, a, not like a typical, but kind of like people would categorize your work as like a central office job. I know you don't work with a particular school district, but you work at like a, a district level. Is that fair to say? Like kind of? No, it's more, we yeah. have, so our IU has, um, 24 districts in our footprint so we work okay. with with the district so it's it's kind it's not oh, it's like a dis district. it's like a district of districts yes is that fair okay so here here's my question for you we're the intermediate between the state and the uh, local schools so we're kind of like the go-between oh that's good so if they got fights they, you're in between we them break so. right up yes <laughs> okay so so here here's uh, i'm curious how in your roles do you stay connected to students 
in, in those roles? How do you stay connected? Now, I know, Shauna, your, your role has changed a little bit and you're working more directly maybe uh, with students as they're kind of going that process. But maybe in the past, like how do you, how do you, because there is a, there is sometimes a, a disconnect, right? Like uh, I remember Stephanie Smith, she's from Illinois. Uh, she was on here and she felt like, that some of the things that she was saying, like her, her viewpoint was really, she worked in admin and then went back to teaching and she's like, Oh, some of the stuff I said in admin didn't really work for students. Right. So how do you keep that connection to students in those roles? I think it's a challenge. I mean, I think that we, as, as consultants, um, we had the good fortune that we could also be coaches too. So we were yeah. kind of always walking that line. So you know, we would do a lot of professional development, but then we would also work with individual teachers. And so that was, you know, when I was in my, my previous role as a consultant, that was kind of like my bread and butter is just keeping connected with students. Right. Um, going in and working with individual teachers and getting back in classrooms. And I was part of it. And honestly, that's part of my motivation for taking this position is because I felt like I was getting yeah. further from students. And of all the things that I was learning that I was, this stuff could so benefit students. I want to do that work. I want to be in that in that space where I can I can really more directly affect uh, student learning. So it it is a challenge, but I think there's ways to do it. You know, coaching. When I was a consultant, coaching was. Lisa. Yeah, I would say that um, for at this point in my life, my kids really keep me grounded because I have a third grader and a fifth grader, so they kind of really keep me grounded in expectations that are realistic for kids but i also feel like shauna like it is a big challenge it's something that i have you know i spent a lot of years as a consultant now um and i do much less coaching now than i did in this last four years than i have done um, but any opportunity that i can have to get back in and coach and model for people has been really helpful um and so i'm working next year on a project to um bring literacy uh, to kids with complex needs. Yeah. And so I've written a proposal and my supervisor has supported uh, me being able to go to classrooms, um, you know, regularly to support uh, reading instruction using a specific curriculum to teach kids with complex needs. So, so it's actually um, there when I was just listening to you, one of the things that you just kind of talked about, and I think it's kind of, part of your roles too. And I think is, um, and maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we, you don't call it this and we should, um, like, uh, they're like most major organizations outside of education have R and D research and development. Right. And so they're like, they're going out and they're researching new practices or going through that. And they're not, they're not, they're not actually like, cause I think we, we kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, outsource that to the colleges, right? We don't necessarily have that connected to the schools where that's where it actually, I think, has the biggest bang for the buck because you can create that program and implement it right away. It's not like, and kind of see how that process goes. And it's like, a lot of times people are like a little bit nervous about, you know, doing something that doesn't have years and years of research about it, except, except for the kids who benefit from it right now. Like we're not doing stuff that we think is like harmful to kids, obviously, right? We're we're, we're, we're kind of connecting in that way. So I, I kind of like that because I was listening to you. I'm like, oh, that's like sounds like R&D. And I think um, in I think Alberta, that's a great way. Yeah, yeah that's Alberta. a great way to describe our jobs. <laughs> yeah, like in, like in Alberta, um, where I live, the province of Alberta, we actually had something like that years ago. And it like accelerated the, the um, we got money. And then it got, of course, we didn't talk about it enough. And then it was like an easy cut. And I think it's kind of hampered us a little bit that we don't have that constant research and looking at new methods and like, how do we best serve kids right now? Um, here, here, so here's a question I'm asking people because so we are recording this on April 12th and uh, here's a, so we're coming up by the time people are watching this, they might be on their break. Um, you know, and we know like break, I use that term loosely, um, you know, they could be in their summer months. So instead of asking you like what you're going to learn, what are you going to do with that? Like, you know, what are you going to do to better yourselves as an educator? Like, what are you going to do just to like chill and relax? I, I know. And I know that your jobs are probably 12 months with vacation and stuff like that, as opposed to you get the typical summer months. Well, okay. So it like, gets kind of all over the place. So what do you, what are you going to do during that time to just kind of like replenish yourself? Cause I think a lot of times we focus on all the learning, but like, what, what about for yourself? 
Well, Shauna doesn't have that chance this year. Sorry, Shauna. Awesome. You want to talk about that? <laughs> I I gave up my summers. Did no, you? um, as a consultant, we we worked a typical teacher contracts. Right. You know, the summers off. I mean, we as a consultant, you still work some days over the summer, yeah. um, more than a teacher typically would. Right. Um, but in this position, it's a, a year-round position. So. Um, right. You know, I'm still, I still cry a little bit about that and thinking about the things I want for my summers. But right. um, I think really for me, it's just making the most of the time that I am home with my family. So, you know, we have a couple of vacations planned, like just mini vacations, kind of weekend, long weekend this yep. summer. Um, and, you know, just finding things that we really enjoy all together. So we, you know, go and stay in the mountains for a couple of weekends and we're going to go to the beach. Lisa, how about you? Um, we are going to Canada, actually. <laughs> Just got our passports. Um, what? We are, we're going to Maine for some time, and then we're taking a ferry from Maine to Nova Scotia. Oh, that's a beautiful area. Driving up to Prince Edward Island and spending some time there. So I'm very much looking forward to that. <laughs> Shout out to Canada. Yeah. Yeah, we just booked our ferry. I love that. So I was actually, so I was thinking about this, right? Um, this is like, you know how, you know how like teachers kind of get this like, oh, well, you got paid that for like 10 months or blah, 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 right? And I was thinking about how, how important that time is to like just kind of rejuvenate, refresh, like a professional athlete, right? Like professional athletes don't play the whole season because it's terrible for your body, Whereas this would be, I actually think it's not only terrible for your mental state, but probably for your emotional state, um, your physical state. And I have no issue. Like, I, I don't believe teachers are working 12 months a year, right? Like you, you got to, and if you are, there's probably something wrong. You got to take a break, right? Even if it's, a, I'm not saying that they don't work beyond what their contract is or something like that, but you got to take a break somewhere, right? And you got to really try to do this. But it's funny because... You know, teachers like, oh, you get paid for like 10 months. And like, that's a pretty good salary. Nobody ever says that about NBA players. Nobody's like, well, you only you only get paid yeah. 10 months, right? Great like, point. Right? It's kind of funny. <laughs> nobody ever says that, right? And I thought like nobody, like, oh, that's a pretty good, like kind of complaining about that. But it is like you do need that time because you like no professional athlete could play year round and not break down. Like you need breaks. And I, I hate that it's been villainized. Uh, in, in, and like, if someone ever said to me, like, oh, when you're a teacher, you're like, oh, you get some, I'm like, yeah, I do. It's awesome. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. like you, you try doing this for 10 months, like, and not go, like, if you do it for a year, you will, and it's not good. So like, you will right. just go, uh, batty, but Hey, I, I, I want to respect your time. And Lisa, thanks. I know that you were going to, you, you came, uh, you, you my, Canadian, my Canadian time zone was a little bit off for you. So calendar but it, it was awesome just to sit down and talk with you so i i i you know i i'm glad we got to just kind of connect and reconnect and do this too so um yeah it's great to see you both and i'm glad you're both doing so well and i feel bad that this feels like the breakup podcast of you two right there is just yeah, like the we're revisit still, we're still besties just not <laughs> in the same spot <laughs> yeah I, are you saying like a royal besties? Like, like, is it you and Lisa are besties, or are you saying like the three of us? The three, okay. Th you know that you're our BFF. <laughs> right, I, just, I just need, I just need it confirmed on the podcast for everyone. Yes, yeah, it's, it's recorded now. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, hey, well, Lisa and Shauna, thanks so much Thank for being you. here. Uh, everyone, thanks for taking the time to listen. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a wonderful day.